Well, this evening I've already told you what it is we're going to be looking at, so I would, um, well, if, you, if you like, you can turn up uh, Psalm 110. That is our text, or of course, follow along on the screen. But in this particular psalm, this is the one that, uh, of course, Jesus uses to trap his opponents when uh, he, well, his opponents knew that this psalm was referring to the Messiah. And the question that Jesus had is, why, if, if the Messiah is David's son, why does David, by the Spirit, call him Lord? Because the Father is always greater than the Son. And, of course, they didn't know how to answer that question, and they dared not ask him any further questions. This psalm is about the Messiah. This psalm is about Jesus Christ, and it reminds us that Jesus has the office of king, as we've already seen in Psalm 2, but also that he is a priest according not to the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, but rather according to the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to see more about that in uh, the book of Hebrews, even as we saw this morning. But let me go ahead and read the psalm as we begin. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Um, I think you can see from this text that the emphasis here is on the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've already seen now two passages uh, that remind us that there are consequences for not submitting to the rule of Jesus Christ. He certainly is a loving king. He is a benevolent king. He offers salvation and forgiveness to all who will come to him. He provides for everyone everything that they have. And yet, those who harden their hearts against him and will not surrender to him eventually will have to suffer his wrath. And that is one thing that we're going to see with regard to his office as king. Now, this morning, uh, we did see the importance of believing Jesus, not just believing you know, that he is the Messiah and trusting him for our salvation, but believing what he says. And particularly, we saw the importance of believing what he had to say about the new birth. Uh, basically, that this is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a sovereign work by the Holy Spirit that you must have in order to enter into heaven. And basically, this evening, we're going to see what Jesus Christ has done to make that work of the Holy Spirit possible. Now we saw that this was not only clearly taught in the Old Testament, but we saw that, that one has actually come down from heaven in order to reveal it more clearly to us, and that of course is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this evening I want us to just back up a bit as it were from that topic, you know, that's zeroing in on one of the offices of Christ, that is his work as prophet to consider a slightly broader context that Jesus was actually given three offices in this work. Three works, as it were, or, or offices that he performs in order to bring you savingly to himself. And of course, it's important for us to know that he is exercising these three offices so that we might know how to respond to each one of them because the Lord actually does expect us uh, to respond appropriately to each. Now this morning, as I said, we were looking at the work that Jesus did as our prophet, that he came down from heaven to show us, well, not only to show us how we could be saved, but of course to provide that work, but he came down to show us. But again, equally important are those other two offices given to him by the Father, that of priest and that of king. All of them were necessary. Jesus did the work of each perfectly and, and continues to do at least that continuing work in each of those offices perfectly. And that is why you can have the hope that one day you will be with him in heaven if you place your whole hope of salvation 
upon him. Remember, there is only one way to God, only one way to be reconciled, not many ways, just one, and that is through Jesus Christ because he alone has done what is necessary in each of these offices to save all who will trust him. So this evening, let's consider these three offices, that Jesus is your prophet, that Jesus is your priest, and that Jesus is your king. Now, first of all, let's consider that Jesus is your prophet. Now, something that I, I suddenly realized that I hadn't done for a long time, but I thought would be helpful, is, is to look at um, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I used to make reference to it all the time, the Westminster Confession of Faith, all the time, but somehow I think I've gotten away from that. I was noticing uh, the, um, uh, the hymnal this morning was turned up to the Westminster Confession of Faith, which means I think Bob Needham last week must have been making reference to it. I didn't even realize that. Well, now the Lord has us looking at um, the Shorter Catechism. And let me just remind you that these are only tools, only tools that were meant to explain uh, the Bible. Uh, the Shorter Catechism in particular was written by the assembly originally to teach new converts, uh, to give them, as it were, a, a summary of what the Bible teaches, a shortcut so that they could learn it more quickly and begin to do what it is the Lord calls them to do more quickly. It, it's really a summary of what the Bible says as a whole, at least those most important doctrines. And let me just say that if you understand the Bible in, in, you know, as a whole, it makes it easier to understand the individual pieces. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I like systematic theology, where you, you, know, you, you sort of understand the teaching of the Bible as a whole, then when you come to one of the pieces, you, you see how it fits with the other pieces that are in the Bible. It gives you a, a much easier way to understand it when you have the framework to hang, as it were, the different pieces on. So let's begin this evening with question 23 of the Shorter Catechism that summarizes uh, the work of Jesus Christ as, as our Savior um, in, in these particular offices. So, first of all, it asks this question. What offices does Jesus execute as our Redeemer? And again, execute is a word that we don't often use. It sounds kind of like you know, putting something to death, but we know it can also be used to refer to the accomplishment of something, uh, to carry something out, to perform something. So what offices does Christ perform as our Redeemer or carry out? Well, the answer is Christ is our Redeemer, executes or performs the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his state of humiliation and exaltation. Now again, this catechism was written a long time ago. Some of these words perhaps we're not familiar with or are not words we commonly use, but I do want you to see what he's saying, or at least what the assembly was saying here. This is a summary of everything Jesus does in the work of saving you and me. And everything that he does is connected to one of these three offices. Now, what this draws our attention to, of course, are those three offices, but also to the fact that part of that work was done while he was on earth in what's called his state or his condition of humiliation. And part of it is something that continues while he's in heaven, that is, in his state or his position of exaltation. Now, the first work mentioned is that of being a prophet. And that's where we get to question 24 of the Shorter Catechism, which says this. It asks the question, how does Christ execute or perform the office of a prophet? Well, the answer is that Christ performs the office of a prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit, the will of God for our salvation. Now you need to realize that if Jesus had not done this, there's no way that we could possibly know how to be saved. Now we can know that we're guilty. We can know we're sinners through our conscience. God's given us a conscience. We know when we've broken his commandments. We know that we are liable to his judgment. But nowhere except in the Bible, and the Bible is essentially the finished work of or at least I should say the finished writing that Jesus has given to us as our prophet, nowhere else but in the Bible can you know the will of God for your salvation. This is the only place the gospel is. It's not written in the stars. You know, you can, 
You can sit under the stars and, and you know, examine them for the, all your life and you're never going to deduce the gospel from it. It's only here. God has shown us that he exists in the creation. We know that natural revelation proves to us that the God of the Bible is, but it does not reveal to us the gospel. That is only here. And it is revealed to us because Jesus is our prophet. Now we saw a great example of this in our passage this morning. Remember, in John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, as Jesus was pointing out to Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, things that he should have known but he didn't know. Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. And he's not talking about Nicodemus and himself, but he's talking about scripture and himself or the witness of the Father, the witness of the Spirit, and the witness of Jesus Christ. We speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen and you, Nicodemus, do not accept our testimony. But you should because it's the word of God. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I've tried to make it simple for you, Nicodemus. I've put it in terms you can understand. I've used earthly images. If you don't understand those, if it's not clear now, you're not going to understand if I tell you more directly. And then Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven to bring this truth down, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of God. Jesus came down from heaven to tell us what God says in our language, language we can understand so that we could know the will of God for our salvation. Remember, John told us earlier that Jesus came down to reveal the Father, to explain him to us. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. As I mentioned this morning, we're going to see in just a couple of weeks how it is that Jesus is able to do this as a man. John the Baptist will say of him, for he, and this is verse 34 of, of John chapter 3, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. So Jesus became a man that he might show us what his father is like, that he might teach us what his father wants us to do, that he might reveal the will of God for our salvation in words that we can understand. Now we, we also noted this morning that Jesus was doing this even before he came into the world. He is the word of God. The Spirit of God through whom he inspired the Old Testament Scriptures was his Spirit and his revelation. So even then, Jesus, he didn't come down from heaven to do this as it were. He didn't become a man to do this when he revealed the Old Testament Scripture. But it's still the Spirit of Christ, still his work as our prophet. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verses 10 through 12, As to the salvation... The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which have now, have, have been, uh, have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels Long to look. Again, this is the Spirit of Christ. This is His Spirit. He sends the Spirit to reveal the will of God for our salvation. It was revealed in the Old Testament in shadow form, in prophecies, in types, but it was revealed. And those, of course, who understood and who received the Messiah who was to come were saved by Jesus Christ and in no other way. But you see, now Jesus is in heaven. Has his work finished? I mean, now that he's given us a completed Bible, now that he's come and he's lived and he's died and he's uh, risen and ascended to heaven, has his work as prophet ceased? No, that work continues. He continues to exercise the office of a prophet by revealing to us from heaven by his word and by his spirit God's will for our salvation. That's one of the reasons why he calls you to read your Bibles. Why he's even made it convenient for you to read your Bibles by allowing you to have your own copy. Uh, why he's put it on the hearts of the organization called the Gideons to make sure there's a Bible everywhere you go, particularly in hotels. 
So there's always going to be a Bible for you to read. I mean, not that you hopefully need to depend on one of those. I hope you carry one with you uh, when you go. But you need to realize that for many centuries, God's people did not have their own copy of the Bible. It wasn't actually until the invention of the printing press, the 1500s, and even then for only those who could afford it. But before the 1500s, nobody really had a printed copy of it. They may have had a handwritten copy, but that would be huge. And then up to that time, basically, if, if somebody wanted to know what the Bible said, they'd have to go to, to a, a church and see you know, the Bible. They had Bibles chained in the churches so that people could read and not take off with them so that others could also read them. Uh, and, of course, in the, in the biblical times, um, there were copies, but usually copies of just one book or another that were read in the synagogue or read in the early churches. But you see, now you have your own copy. Now you can read it anytime you want. Now you can read it to your heart's desire. You know, Jesus wants to speak to you. And he wants you to hear him. And that's why he has given you his word. And why he commands you to read his word. And also why he commands it to be read in the worship service. Why he commands it to be explained in the worship service and applied. This is how he speaks to us today, how he exercises his office, office as a prophet. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through uh, the word preached. He speaks by his word and by his spirit. Everything that is said that agrees with his word is Jesus' word. Now, we do understand that Jesus also talks to us in, in some respects by opening and closing doors for us providentially. But that can be a little bit subjective. We don't want to always trust that, but we do understand he does guide us in that way as well. So let me ask you first with regard to this, how are we to respond to what Jesus says? If Jesus is speaking to us and he wants to be heard, are you listening to Jesus? Are you reading his, 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 his word? Are you reading your Bibles? Now, I've already mentioned to you that we're, well, you're, you're all, you all pretty much know that we're doing the reading the Bible together, which is where we, we read the same books at the same time and we try to cull ideas and then we get together and we share those ideas with one another. That's one great way that the Lord has given to us to hear what he has to say. Are, are you reading the, the Bible? Are you reading together with, with your brothers and sisters uh, in this program? Uh, if you haven't been in the discussions, maybe you should consider uh, reading and getting together and in joining in those, those times because they're really quite a blessing. And when you read your Bibles, are you reading them uh, in the way you should and trying to get out of them what you should? I mean, we can't just pick up the Bible and our Bible reading program and we can knock out three chapters and we can say, I've, I've done it and I've read my Bible for today, therefore I'm going to be blessed but if you haven't read the Bible to get to know the Father, to get to know the Son, to understand the Spirit and His will for you, if you haven't read with a, with a believing heart and a submissive heart, if you haven't listened in the, in the Hebrew sense, which is not just to hear the words themselves or even just to understand what they mean, but to listen that you might submit to them, then you haven't really read it in the way the Lord would have you to read it. Jesus is speaking, and he wants you to listen to him. And Jesus reminds us that if we love him, that's what we're going to do by nature, because that's what we will want to do. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, which means that if you love Jesus, you'll read the word of God that you might know what his commandments are in order that you might obey him. And remember, the Ten Commandments are a summary of everything the Lord would have us to do, but the application of those Ten Commandments is very broad, and you really need to whole, read the whole Bible to understand it. Are you paying attention to what's read in the worship service and, and what's expounded in the sermons as we meet together for worship? Are you growing in your understanding of the Lord and of His will for your life? Uh, we do need to remember that God has given to us the best possible teacher, and that is God in human flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. That he has given to you everything that you need to know in his word to believe and everything you need to know to live the kind of life 
that is honoring to him, make sure that you take advantage of what Jesus has done for you in his office as prophet so that the admonition, the author to the Hebrews, as we read this morning, that he applied to his readers would never actually apply to you. Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14 reminds us the Lord wants us to grow in our understanding. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Jesus speaks. He teaches through his word. And he wants you to listen. He wants you to learn. He wants you to grow in your understanding so that you might grow more into his image. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, verses 17 through 18, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And Peter there was addressing those who were saying that, you know, the Lord's coming. Well, actually, the Lord wasn't going to come. Everything just continues the way it was from the beginning. He says, don't listen to them. Well, there's a lot of people teaching a lot of things today that aren't true either. Don't listen to them. But grow in your understanding of the Bible. Grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Grow in your love and commitment to him so that you will be steadfast against all those errors that are out there that people are believing that can destroy them actually. So Jesus is your prophet. Secondly, Jesus is your priest. Question 25 of the Shorter Catechism reads this, or asks the question, how does Christ execute or perform the office of a priest? The answer is Christ performs the office of a priest in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Now here's what we usually think of when we think of the work of Jesus Christ as Savior. Uh, all of them are involved though, you need to understand, but this is the one we often think about. Now, what is a priest? A priest is someone who offers sacrifice for his people and prays for them that they might be reconciled to God. Uh, he is one that must share the same nature as those that he represents so that he can understand how to pray for them because he understands their weaknesses. The author to the Hebrews we saw this morning, I told you we'd come back to this passage, here we are again, in Hebrews 5 verses 1 through 3. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal uh, gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself is also beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. So a priest is one who offers sacrifice and praise and one who is basically, well, who is of the same nature as the one that he represents. Um, now, one other thing that's very important is that uh, a, a man may not simply just decide one day he wants to be a priest. Uh, like, you know, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be president or whatever. It's not a decision that you can make. In the Old Testament, there were a, a group of men who actually decided they wanted to be priests after God had said, only the sons of Aaron. And we saw how the Lord responded to them, to Korah, to Dathan, to Abiram, and on in Numbers 16. Basically, fire came out from the tent of the Lord and consumed all the men standing before him. And the earth opened up in the camp and swallowed their tents and all their belongings, everything that they had. Uh, you don't just simply intrude into the priestly office. The Lord... Uh, has reminded us uh, very uh, pointedly that that is the case. You have to be appointed by God to this office. Hebrews 5, verse 4. 
And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. Well, this office is what the Father has appointed Jesus to, uh, that he might do what is necessary, that he might offer to the Father a sacrifice of obedience to his commandments, so he might provide righteousness for you, that he might offer a sacrifice of himself on the cross to pay for your sins, and that he might intercede or he might pray to keep you securely in his family, in his grace. So the author to the Hebrews continues in verses 5 through 10. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Those come out of the two Psalms we read for the call to worship and the text that we're looking at. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, we might expect the author to the Hebrews to say something like this, having become perfect, he became to all those who believed on him the source of eternal salvation. But he doesn't use the word believe there, he uses the word obey. And why does he do that? Well, it's because that's what the word believe means. It means to trust Jesus, it means to submit to Jesus, it means to follow Jesus, it means to turn from your sins and do his will. All of that is wrapped up in the word believe. It doesn't just mean believe the facts. The devils, uh, James tells us, believe all the facts. They know them very well, but they're not saved because they believe the facts. Even unconverted people can believe the facts. There's people, sadly, who are suffering even now in hell who believe the facts. There's more than just believing the facts. You need to believe the facts, but you also need to trust the one that those facts are about. You need to trust Jesus to save you. And you need to obey him. Now that comes up when we look at his office as king, but let's not miss that, that particular point here. Now we do know in this work as priest that he completed part of this work on earth. He obeyed God here. He obeyed the law here. He obeyed his father and he died on the cross, and he only had to do that once. Again, the catechism reminds us of that. Hebrews 9.28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. In other words, when he comes again, he's not going to have to deal with sin again because he's already done dealt with it once and for all on the cross. He's not offered many times. The Roman church actually teaches that every time the mass is celebrated, Christ is sacrificed again. But he isn't. Only the one time. Again, Hebrews 7, verses 26 through 27. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of, his, of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. It was only one time it was needed because that was a sacrifice of infinite worth because the one who offered himself up was God in human flesh. So that part of his work is done on earth, but there's still a part of it that he continues to do in heaven, and that is intercede. Now he prayed on earth as we've seen, but he continues to pray in heaven. He continues to intercede for us, pleading the merits of his work on our behalf. Jesus prays. Hebrews 7, verses 24 through 25. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, not like the Aaronic priests who died off, because he has the power of an indestructible life, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently, 
Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is continuing his work as priest in heaven by praying for you if you are trusting in him. So how do we respond to this? Well, the question is, are you trusting Jesus Christ because he's done this work for those who will trust him? Are you trusting the work that he has done for you as, his, as your priest? Now, how often do we find ourselves struggling with whether or not we're going to actually make it to heaven? You know, that's always, I think, the big question. Even in the church, even in those who trust in Jesus. Now, you understand, if, if entering into heaven depended on you, if it depended on your works, if it depended on your righteousness, then you could know one thing with certainty. You would never actually get there because you're never going to be good enough. But since entering into heaven, since your salvation is based upon the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ, since it's based upon a perfect sacrifice and his perfect intercession, you can know certainly that you're going to make it to heaven. You can have what the author to the Hebrews calls a full assurance of faith. Now, you do know that there's a bit of, um, uh, of a, well, not a wrinkle, but there's, there is the issue, okay, yes, if I'm trusting Jesus Christ, I can know that I'm going to make it to heaven. But in order to have that assurance, you have to know that you're trusting in Jesus Christ. You have to have the evidence that you really do belong to him. That when you say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I've turned from my sins, that I really am believing in him. I really am turning from my sins. And you should know by now what that evidence is that you should be looking for. And it's the evidence of a godly life. It's a life of trusting Jesus in the way that we saw the author to the Hebrews said that we must trust him. Belief is not just believing the facts. Belief means giving ourselves to him in loving submission to his will. Again, previewing the office as king. Remember what we read this morning in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. The author to the Hebrews says this, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name, and having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Remember, this comes at the end of that really, um, well, difficult passage in Hebrews chapter 6. It talks about those who fall away and can't be renewed to repentance. And he talked about what they were like, and I won't get into that again right now, but I will say this. The author to the Hebrews, after he talks about those who have fallen away, he turns to them and he says, but beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, even though we're speaking in this way. And then he, he tells them this. This is the evidence that you belong to the Lord, the love which you have shown toward his name, in ministering and still ministering to the saints, showing diligence in what the Lord has given you to do, not being sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The way you can know that you're really trusting in Jesus Christ is the evidence of a changed life, a life that shows that you really do love the Lord. Now that's kind of a no-brainer, but there's so many people today, so many churches that are teaching, there's no difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, none. Except one of them has prayed the sinner's prayer and the other one hasn't. One of them believes the facts and the other doesn't. Are there people who believe that? There certainly are. As a matter of fact, it wasn't that long ago they were the majority. But no, the Lord says if he saved you, he, he transforms you into his image by his Holy Spirit through the new birth that we were looking at this morning. Well, this brings us to the last point. Finally, Jesus is your king. Question 26 of the Shorter Catechism reads this. How does Christ, I'm going to again substitute the word, how does Christ perform the office of a king? 
Christ performs the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Now then, I've, I've said, okay, this is where obedience comes in. And we talk about Jesus as Savior. He is the prophet who reveals to us the will of God for our salvation so we can know what we need to do. We need to trust in him. We need to obey him and so forth. As a priest, he makes the sacrifice and he prays for us. But as king, he rules over us and we need to obey him. Now, one thing that may not be immediately clear about uh, the answer to this question is that first part where it says, Christ performs the office of a king in subduing us to himself. Jesus had to subdue us to himself. I mean, why? Well, because we were his enemies. And the first thing that he did in applying salvation to us was he subdued our rebellious hearts. Now, we saw how he did that this morning. It's the new birth that he gives through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God changes your heart. He makes you willing to obey. This is taught throughout Scripture in many places, but let me just give you one other one. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, after Paul describes our condition coming into the world, that we're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, we're going the same direction the rest of the world is going, and we would have gone, we were children of wrath, and would have gone to hell with the rest of them. But, he says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the spirit or the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The new birth, you have to be born of the water and of the Spirit if you are to see and enter into the kingdom. It is a sovereign act of the Spirit of God and that is the act that subdues our rebellious heart so that we will then bow the knee to Jesus Christ because we're like, nobody, we're like everybody else when we come into the world. You know, we, we are stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and God, as we saw this morning, has to be the one who circumcises our hearts. We're like, we're like those bones laid out in the, in the valley of dry bones of Ezekiel's vision. We have no more power to serve God than those bones have to, get, to come together and stand upright and serve God. We're dead. We're in the grave. We were dead in trespass and sin. But God is the one who breathed life into our souls by his Holy Spirit and caused us to live. So that is the work of Jesus Christ as our King, subduing us to himself. He does it by changing our hearts and making us willing to submit to him. And again, we understand that not everybody understands that when they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because it's, it appears as though we're the ones who, who are just doing it on our own strength. But we do need to recognize we didn't always trust Jesus. We didn't always want to trust Jesus. There was a time when we wanted to do our own thing, but then there comes a time when we do want to submit, we do want to trust. Was that just a change that took place in my own mind, in my own heart? Something that, that just sort of happened biologically? Or is it something that happened spiritually? The Bible says the Spirit of God made that change. He's the one who made that difference. And that is the work of Christ as your king, subduing you to himself. Secondly, as our king, not surprisingly, he rules over us. That's what kings do, right? They issue commandments and subjects obey. Now the reason why the Lord subdued you by his Holy Spirit was so that you might obey him. Again, that's the whole purpose behind redemption is, well, it is to give God glory for his grace, but it's also so that you and I would stop being rebels and begin being submissive servants. We would begin doing what it is we should be doing and what it is the Lord would have us to do, which is loving him and loving our neighbor as ourselves. That, that is the only crime that, that any, you know, any critic of Christianity should ever be able to level at a Christian is, you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself. If you're doing anything other than that in the way the Lord calls you to do, you're not doing what God calls you to do because that is his will. That's what he commands you to do. And that's why he saved you was so that you might do it just like Jesus did. Jesus loved his father. 
submitted to him. Jesus loved his neighbor as he loved himself. He is the perfect example of what we are to be. And that is also the evidence you really do know him, is that you really do obey him. Uh, John writes in 1 John 3.24, The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. Again, Jesus brings the spirit into the mix because he's the one who actually subdues our hearts that we might submit to the Lord and obey his commandments. And then finally, as our king, he restrains and conquers all his and our enemies. Now, of course, you understand that once you belong to him, his enemies and your enemies are the same group of enemies, okay? And the subjection of those enemies is what we've already read uh, in, in our text this evening. The father promised his son for the work that he would do in saving us. One of the, well, one of the parts of that work is subduing us to himself. I mean, we're already subjected. We're already conquered by Jesus Christ. He's already brought us to bow the knee. So we're in subjection. But all the rest of his enemies are also going to be subdued Perhaps not in the same way. I mean, there will be many, a multitude which no one can number, that will be brought to Christ and will bow the knee willingly, but there's going to be far more that aren't going to do it willingly, but still will bow the knee. David writes in Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now that, I think, is referring mainly to those, of course, that that do not love him. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, For he, that is Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now if we had time to get into this, this one passage tells us that all of Christ's enemies are going to be subdued under his feet. From what we've just looked at, they're going to be subdued in one of two ways. They're either going to, by his spirit, willingly bow the knee, or they're going to be forced to bow the knee uh, at some point in history, perhaps on the day of judgment. But I think it's quite likely, from what we understand in Scripture, that this is a process. And as this process goes on, and more and more, are, more, and more of Christ's enemies are subdued under his feet, we should see a change. But we do know that whenever that change takes place and whenever this work is completed, it's going to make a huge difference in what this world is like. This is our hope. This is our promise that ultimately all the stuff we see going on that we know is dishonoring to the Lord, things that he hates, things that we hate because we have his spirit in us, they are going to change. And one day everything is going to be perfect ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth but it's going to happen because the Lord says it is so finally in applying this let's ask these questions if Jesus is our king is subduing people to himself has he done that for you has he subdued you to himself well how do you know you know in the fact that you're submitting. You're submitting to Jesus Christ and you're obeying him. Is that what you're doing? Are you submitting to Jesus? Are you obeying him? Not just in 5 out of 10 or 9 out of 10, but 10 out of 10 commandments in everything that the Lord calls you to do. Well, if, if, if he has subdued your heart, if you have experienced the new birth, then you will because What the Spirit does is He makes you love Him. And if you love Him, you will obey Him. Jesus, again, in John 14, 15, as we read earlier, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Conversely, or on the other hand, if you don't obey Him, it just shows that you really don't love Him. And if you don't love Him, you don't belong to Him. And if you don't belong to Him, then you need what Jesus told Nicodemus He needed, In order to enter into the kingdom, as we saw this morning, you must be born again. If this is your situation this evening, then you need to seek the Lord. But I do want to remind you that the Lord puts a a certain condition on the kind of seeking that he's 
he's actually going to allow himself to be found by. It, it's a seeking with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. He says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, how can you really seek after the Lord in this way if you really don't love him? If you really don't want to find him? You see, if you don't love him, you really don't want to find him. And there's a number of people who, you know, seek the Lord in a certain sense, but they're really not seeking him because they love him or they really want him, but it's only because they don't want to go to the other place. Um, as a matter of fact, that, that is very strong and compelling reason to seek after the Lord, but that's not enough. Now, this is why... Jesus told Nicodemus, you need the new birth. You need the birth of the Holy Spirit because only the Spirit of God can give you the kind of heart that you need to seek the Lord in the only way that you're going to find Him. And that is with all your heart. And since the Lord alone is the one who can give the Spirit, the only way you can get the Spirit is by going to Him. Pray and ask Him for that Spirit to change your heart so that you will listen to what Jesus says uh, as he speaks to you as prophet, so that you will place your whole hope on the work that Jesus Christ has done as priest, so that you will turn from your rebellion into the path of obedience. That's the only way that you can seek the Lord and find him. And let me just remind you that if you don't find him, then you will certainly face judgment. So here is motivation to seek after the Lord if you do not love him in this way. In closing, let me just read this one passage from Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7 as an encouragement to do this. The prophet writes, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek him with all your heart, and God will reveal himself to you in a gracious way. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard and Again, as, as we need to hear it as individuals.